Good evening. Welcome to Fundação Oriente. We are here today for the book release Feasts and Fests of Goa by Professor Celina de Almeida. Dear Professor Celina de Almeida, thank you for this initiative and for all the efforts that have been putting in this in this book. Thanks. It's your first book, right? So, you are an example. You are the proof that it's never too late what we want to do. I will never forget the first thing that you told me in our first meeting. She told me, Paulo, I'm nervous. <laughs> And I told you, you don't be, or you don't need to be nervous. Be proud of yourself instead because you did a great job and produced a wonderful tribute to Goa, its people, its culture, and its traditions. Today you are surrounded by friends, by family, so enjoy your day because you deserve it. Agora, como sei que fala e entende lindamente português, uh, I'm so sorry for that, but I will speak a little in Portuguese. Uh, gostava de dizer algumas palavras em português. Dizer-lhe em primeiro lugar que é uma grande honra para a Fundação receber, uh, no fundo, o lançamento deste livro, uh, porque de facto é um grande contributo, como disse há pouco, para Goa. E num momento em que nós vamos perdendo as nossas referências, uh, referências de liderança, acima de tudo, temos muitas saudades, todos nós, das lideranças fortes do passado, das lideranças que privavam, primavam por defesa de causas uh, de grande valor. Vamos perdendo isto, principalmente da geração mais jovem. Hoje tudo é muito mais fugaz, hoje tudo é muito mais rápido, uh, muito mais superficial até, onde falta-nos profundidade é muito daquilo que são as nossas ações e as defesas das nossas causas, de uma forma geral. Isto a nível global. Falo da Índia, como falo de Portugal, como falo um pouco por todo o mundo. Eu creio que nós temos que ser esse exemplo. E exemplo, não pensar por vezes em grandes projetos, mas pelas atitudes cotidianas. Exemplo para os nossos familiares, para os nossos amigos, para a nossa comunidade. E este seu exemplo, seu primeiro livro, nesta fase da sua vida, com certeza terá um efeito catalisador. Isto é o efeito borboleta, não é? O bater de asas de uma borboleta numa localidade longínqua tem muita influência aqui, neste lado. E, portanto, será com certeza um grande exemplo para os seus alunos, que têm um grande orgulho em si, aos seus ex-alunos, mas também para todas as pessoas que aqui estão, que nunca é tarde. E, portanto, muitos parabéns por isso e todos nós estamos muito orgulhosos do seu trabalho. Obrigado. Agora eu vou to hand it over to Miss Lucet. Ok? And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Paolo Gomes. A very good evening, dear friends, to a special evening we've all been waiting for. We've already been warmly welcomed to this beautiful environment by none other than the director himself, Dr. Paula Gomes, director of Fundação Orient Goa. Thank you, sir, for setting off the right mood for the launch of the colorful and deeply engrossing book, Feasts and Fests of Goa, the flavor of a unique culture by Mrs. Salina de Almeida. The fruit of your own hard work is the sweetest, said Dipika Padukone, and how true these words. Our warmest congratulations on your well-deserved success. You truly are an inspiration. 
and now, it's just the right moment to unfold the covers of the erstwhile book. To do the honors, we have a renowned writer himself, an anthrop anthropologist, a preacher, inviting Dr. Jason Keith Fernandez to please launch and present Feasts and Fests of Goa, the flavor of a unique culture to us. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, truly a book of flavor. Taste and enjoy at your own leisure. Asking Dr. Jason now to please say a few words. Excelentíssimo Sr. Paulo Gomes, da Galda Fundação Oriente em Goa, estimado senhoras e senhores, boa tarde. Um, I'm not going to continue in Portuguese. For fear that most of you, a number of you may not, be, not understand. Um, what a pleasure it is to be here. The single word that repeatedly popped into my head when I was reading. Uh, Professor Celine Almeida's uh, Feasts and Fests of Goa, the flavor of a unique culture, was performance. Now, um, if, you are, if you are to not think that I'm actually insulting uh, Professor Celina, you will need some kind of context to appreciate the word. So among anthropologists and cultural studies scholars, um, there is a recognition that things do not simply exist. They must be acted or performed uh, for them to exist. We need to act out with our bodies a concept and an idea that is in our heads um, for that idea or concept to be tangible to other people. Um, we need to speak or perform our language for the language community to exist. We have to perform politeness for a polite society to exist. Else, as we all know, uh, if you look around us, it will cease to exist. Or, for example, I wear a clerical habit to manifest a Catholic model and social order without wearing my habit, or a number of us wearing the habit. The Catholic model and social order may exist, but it does so only in our heads. And in this way, it is easy to dismiss or even destroy. Performance, therefore, is at the heart of social activity. So what exactly is uh, Celine Dalmeida performing through this book? And does this performance have any value? I would argue that there are a number of performances here, and all of them are of great value, especially in the imperial times in which we live. And for this reason, her performance is, is virtuous. I think this has already been touched upon by both uh, uh, Ms. Virginkar and uh, Paulo Gomes. And I'd like to underline that fact. 
To begin with, Professor Almeida is continuing a performance that first began in the 18th century, which is that of the literary elite. The literary worlds of the 18th century laid the foundations for the republics and democracies that we have today, when people with opinions express them in writing as books for an audience. In doing so, they created a public sphere of ideas and debate. This modus vivendi found expression in Portugal as well, and through Portugal in Goa too, where we had a flourishing public sphere of debate, discussion, and polemics. I was first introduced to this word polemics by someone who's sitting in the audience over here, um, uh, Dr. Lutz Bravo Costa, and, and to the whole idea that there was this Goan public sphere, uh, which was polemical. So this is the other performance affected by this book. It continues a grand Goan tradition of public discussion. Professor Almeida has an opinion on Goa, on the way tourism should be in Goa and various other things, and what could be done to make it better. And she expresses this in the book, uh, fulfilling the task of a public intellectual. So this performance as a public intellectual is even more critical because it comes at a difficult time when public discussion is under threat and people are afraid to express their opinions. So thus far, we have the performance as a member of the literary elite of the public intellectual. And there is one other performance that this book affects, which is also important. This book performs Goa. It maps out Goa in terms of places, regions, communities. And this is critical, this mapping out is critical, because um, it is through such mappings that places are produced and, and persist. The moment we stop performing this Goa, the moment the Selina Dalmedas of, this war, of, of Goa stop writing about Goa, this Goa will be gone. More importantly than merely performing Goa, Professor Selina performs a Goa where communities live in harmony, unaffected by the wickedness of Hindu nationalism. I have to confess that when I first read the book, I was a little irritated or annoyed by the book and its focus on these feasts, for which I often have little time. I thought, oh, this is so backward looking, it's full of nostalgia, saudades, uh, and I'd like to stride into the future. Um, I kept think, turning the pages and thinking about this, until I realized that while we do need to stride into the future, we also need to do so from a past and a present that is harmonious. Selin Dalmeda's book fulfills this necessary task. Also by having done the work of an amateur ethnographer, she captures a time, 2022, when this harmonious Goa still exists, even though it is under threat. And it tells us that there was a value to this time, and in the future, we might need to look back and emulate it. For all of these performances, therefore, I thank you, Professor, most sincerely, as I'm sure your readers and future generations, more importantly, will thank you as well. But a remembrance of Goa or a documenting of Goa is not sufficient for us to save Goa from the evil that threatens it. We also need to develop new tools which can secure the Goa we love from destruction. New tools need to be built not in laboratories or in ivory towers, but from an experience from the ground. And this is something else that marks the book. As I've already indicated, Professor Almeida has actually visited many, if not all, of the sites of the feasts. And her work is thus the work of an amateur ethnographer. I say amateur not to say that you, it's not perfect, but merely because you don't have the official uh, degree of, uh, of an ethnographer, right? And this, be, this fact of being an ethnographer is another feature of a past generation of the literary elite of our land. Um, and this ethnography that Professor Selin has, 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 has done 
yields details that we can now use to build the tools that will correct the mistakes of the past. Take for example, her reference to the practice associated with the feast of the three kings in Kuil, where the flags accompanying the kings are waved in a circular motion at each of the standing of fallen megaliths in that village. I was struck by this description because this is so similar to a practice I, uh, I witnessed in the Italian city of Siena um, last year. I was there for the Feast of Corpus Christi. I took part in the procession, uh, which started in the monastery I was living in, and went up to the cathedral, which is fabulous, as you know. Um, and when the procession concludes, and just before it ends, I would imagine the various um, wards or bayous of the uh, city are represented by these fabulously dressed uh, flag bearers. And each of the flag bearers comes before the altar and waves their flag in this circular motion, lets the flag trail onto the ground, and they march out. Then there are other details she provides about the same feast, when people pass under the horses used by the three kings. Now, so often in Goa, we assume that many of the Catholic practices that exist here but don't obtain in Europe are the result of Hindu customs. But in fact, this practice of passing under the horse seems to be similar to that of the custom of passing through the, uh, under, the, under Duldul in the Muharram processions. And uh, this, is, this is an interesting detail because I finally have it on print now, right, from someone who's gone and witnessed the feast. And I can now say, well, here you are. Initially, I had, photo I had photographs, but now I also have it in print, which is great, at least for a scholar. Um, and it allows us to start talking seriously about the Islamic base of Goan society, a topic that needs to get way more attention than we give it. There is something that I wish this book had done. I wish it had been more critical of, perhaps even an attack and debunk, but Professor Selina is too nice a person to attack. Um, so the work will have to be done by me. Um, of, 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 of um, being critical, attacking, debunking, older forms of presenting Goa, forms which were established in the 19th century, continued in the 20th, and are now reaping their harvest of hate. We must not forget that much of Goan popular history, and I stress that much of it is popular and not academic, and therefore not rigorous history, is a result of Portuguese anti-clericalism of the 19th and the 20th centuries. We are so used to assuming that the Portuguese are Catholic. This is so far from the truth. Uh, the Portuguese were also at the, at the heart of very vicious anti-clericalism. Um, added to this was the desire of local dominant castes, Brahmins and Shardos both, to try and fit their caste and family histories to work with the Indian nationalism that was emerging in the 20th century. Thus, we have silly tales of demolished temples and churches built over them, of idols retrieved and re-established in villages outside the control of the Portuguese. These are all myths, and we need to contest them, and this is a task I wish this book had also taken up. I also wish that the book had been even more assertive of the goodness that Catholicism brought to Goa. I'm a very demanding reader. This is not to say that the book is not assertive. I want even more. Indeed, Goa was produced because of the Catholicism that came with the Portuguese. There was no Goa, as we understand it today, before the Portuguese. Salset and Bardez were not part of the same terrain, they were not part of the same region. One belonged to Bijapur, the other belonged to Vijayanagar. In her discussion of the Handi Fest in, uh, of Kurtari, Professor Selina once again gives us important details that will prove helpful to future scholars. She points out that, and I quote, in pre-Portuguese times, this ceremony of constructing the handi was preceded by a ritual in conformity with the religious beliefs of those times. A cockerel was slaughtered, and its blood was smeared on the spot where the handi was to be bit. Professor Sor Almeida is very demure about this detail. But the fact is that pre-Portuguese Goa, which we often assume was this lyrical land of peace and love, 
was in fact a very violent and bloodthirsty space. A ritual bloodletting, which even today, thanks to our Catholic sensibilities, a sensibility shared even by Hindus, are horrified by, was in fact quite common. Indeed, importing knowledge from other parts of the subcontinent, we know that the blood of the cockerel would have been used to satisfy the spirit of a person who had originally been killed to protect the handi. When cockerel blood was not sufficient, once again persons could be offered. If the, if the ban broke after repeated offerings of cockerel blood, you have to finally sacrifice a human being. It is perhaps to the credit of the Islamic heritage of pre-Portuguese Goa that we do not have records of human sacrifice happening when the missionaries came in. Islamic rule may have prohibited human sacrifice, but it did nothing to prevent the sacrifice of animals. This was put to an end by the adoption of Catholicism by the local populace, who would have realized with relief they do not need any more to offer repeated blood sacrifices because of the one sacrifice that saves all and can be represented day in and day out which, and it had already been made for them. I'm speaking about the sacrifice of Calvary, of course. It is because of this Catholic logic that you have crosses in so many places in Goa, like at Manos Gates, where earlier blood sacrifice, where earlier blood sacrifice would have been demanded annually. Catholicism did make Goa better. Among all the nice things that I have to say about this book, however, I also have a significant complaint to make. Professor Almeida is already aware of my complaint, don't worry. The book is in English, and while it is welcome, I believe that this book should have been written in Portuguese. It would have reached a more diverse audience, and would have, above all, effected the performance that is so, so important in our times to assert that Portuguese is our language, a Goan language, that it is still alive, and more importantly, it must be alive if we are to be alive. I trust that having now published this book in English, Professor Selina Almeida will make sure her next opus is to translate the book into Portuguese, a task for which I wish her well. Um, and finally, thank you for this signal honor of inviting me to release the book. Uh, an honor I don't believe I'm, I'm worthy of, but thank you nevertheless. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jason, for helping us understand and learn to appreciate pearls of information which may have slowly slipped away from the annals of Goa. According to Leonardo da Vinci, people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen. They went out and happened to things. Now the author herself, Mrs. Selina de Almeida, will share glimpses of what happened and inspired her on this three-year journey through Goa, enjoying and understanding the various feasts and fests of Goa. Over to you, Mrs. Selina de Almeida. After her sharing, excuse me, after her sharing, the forum is open to interaction and if you have any questions or you like any clarification, the author will be all yours. Thank you, Dr. Paul Lodge. He's, uh, besides being the director, he's a young, dynamic, and open-minded personality. Dr. Jason, Keith Fernandez, a renowned writer, anthropologist, and I thank you very much for the deep analysis that you have done of my book. And I hope I can do something better if I try next time another book. Ms. Lucette Bijinkan, she is a committed teacher, counselor at Nirmala Institute, and above all, my true friend, true friend, for many, many years. 
Good evening, dear friends and family. I'm so delighted to have such a well-known audience present today. Long back, I can't remember when, I had read about the maxim of a Chinese sage. He said, for a human being to be inclusive, complete, he needs to fulfill three things. Plant a tree, we have planted a forest. Have a child, we have four. And write a book. So here I am, a complete human being according to the Chinese dictum. The book, the forest and the children. My book, Feasts and, and Fests of Goa, the flavor of a unique culture has 21 chapters. Each chapter describes a festival which is enriched with colored photos. It was a very, very arduous work of more than three or four years, participating in the festival, interviewing the people, photographing. Many of the photographs are by professionals because I am not a professional photographer researching, writing, and finally publishing. I will quote from my book a part of a poem in Konkani of our renowned Goan poet, Bhagibab Borkar, which is a free translation. If in my reincarnation the gods asked me to choose a place where I could be born again, I would choose Goa. It has such natural beauty, which helps to perfect the human spirit with creativity and spirituality. End of the quote. And this is the reason why I have chosen to write about Goa, its unique festivals, unpaired. No doubt, every state in India has its own festivals depending on their culture and their traditions. But ours, Goans, are unique because we are a synthesis of many cultures. The indigenous Goan communities for centuries have given great value to the environment, be it water, soil, trees, mud, and this has led them to celebrate festivals like the Hani at Maina Kutori, where water conservation is the theme. They build dikes or manas and so create a land which is going to be used to practice cultivation. What do they use to build these manas? Chikal or mud, natural items, branches of trees or coconut palms, and put in stored water for the cultivation of paddy. These systems of water management of our indigenous people are a tribute to their knowledge of conservation of water. Chikalkalo at Marcella in Ponda commemorates our attachment with the earth. The villagers, they have no distinction. You are old, you are young, no distinction. They coat their bodies with the oil from the lamp of the temple and throw themselves in the chikal. When I saw that, my God, I said, they, everybody is, is rolling in the chikal, in the wet mud, in the patio or Devika Krishna temple in Marcel. This festival affirms our gratitude to the connection that we have to our terra, our mud of our Goa. Then we have festivals like the Toshan Chen Fest, Tisran Chen, Rosan Chen, Konsan Chen, where we recognize these elements of nature like the Toshi, the cucumber, the Tisru, the clams, the Rosa, the marigolds, the Konsan, the first paddy. And what do we do with these elements of nature? By celebrating, we sanctify them and celebrate the feasts because these celebrations show our respect to all forms of life. This is the foundation of our Indian culture. Before I go further, I would like to inform you about a being which is very much distinctly connected to nature. I have not spoken about it in any of my chapters, the Dyaochar. You must have heard about Dyaochar Ambo, 
They'll sell us things. They'll tell us manners. They'll sell us zago. You must have heard if you're living in the villages. I don't know how much we living in cities know about this. I'm sure this was, whether Dyosar existed or not, I don't know. I'm not sure. But this was a practice of preserving our trees, the habitat of insects, birds, butterflies, reptiles, and also of stopping soil erosion. Nobody dared to go near those places where they knew that Dyosar lived. I don't know whether they lived or not. But for generations, we have inherited forests clean, waters unpolluted, our rivers. I really hope that Dyosar lives today in our forests, in our rivers, and stops what is happening in Goa today. Further, I have dealt with festivals of historical background, like the Musar at Shandor, the Sontrio at Kungoli, the Feast of Our Lady of Portsuguru, and the celebrations of Epiphany, which have its historical and religious background. Not much has been written about the Musar in Shandor. I depended on my participation in the festival, which is celebrated on uh, Monday of Carnival. It is always late at night. In interviewing local people and reading Zenaida's Murenas, the Musar of Shandor, the dance of Christian Kshatriyas. Chandrapur, Chandrapur was the capital of Kadamba Kingdom, 1104 to 1141, and at that time there were constant warfares. This conflicting sort of situation, the warfare between the other kingdoms and the Kadambas, had a very great impact on the life of the Shardos or Kshatriyas. Because they say, even today, they, I have relatives in Shandor, they say we are descendants of Kadamba kings. Musar is a rice pounding stick. It's made of bamboo. It is seven feet long, and at the end, it has hawk bells. Now, in the past, the women used this musar to pound rice at home. But in the dance, it is used by men folk to pound or destroy the enemies. The Musar Care is an exhibition of the history of Shandor in dance form, and it should be preserved. Then we have the festival of Sontrior, umbrellas. It holds sway over both major communities of Kukoli, the Christians and the Hindus. Besides the historical trail of the festival, which I'm not going to deal here, I would like to state that this festival is deep rooted in the worship of Hindu goddess Shantadurga. She is seen as the goddess of power, protection, healer of diseases, savior of the poor by both the communities, the Christians and the Hindus. Therefore, the festival in the month of February or March is a landmark in the Hindu calendar in Kunkuli. At Surlatar, a village in Pishovi, a matchless festival is celebrated as one at one of the oldest mosques of Goa, built by Adil Shah around 1535. It is a celebration where the Muslims and the Hindus, I repeat, Muslims and the Hindus, display such communal, communal harmony. It is celebrated in March during Shikmo festival. Therefore, I say our festivals are unique, not in any other part of, of beyond Goa. Sajwan, I'm sure many have already taken a dip in the wells. I don't know whether there is a, the wells are full or not, but they have taken a dip. It's a festival introduced by the Portuguese in our culture. And the government banks upon it, advertises in all kinds of media forms. Come, tourists come to Goa, celebrate Sajwan, Portuguese festival, they're calling them. Much before the arrival of the Portuguese, our indigenous communities celebrated Zagor, which means to be awake, to be in vigil. All the participants and the villagers stay awake throughout the night to worship the gods, 
spirits of ancestors that protect the village. Zagor is a Hindu theater usually celebrated in the temples. For various historical reasons, which I've explained in my article, it was wrapped up in many years of silence, although the performers continued to celebrate it secretly. It surfaced again in mid-18th century. The Zagor is a distinctive feature of the indigenous Gaude community who converted to Christianity in the 17th century and to Hinduism in the 20th century. The Zagot has three parts. The first is the prayer where the Gaudi community continue to pay homage to the Catholic saints that their grandparents worshipped. The second part of the, is the Naman or praise dedicated to the gods of the Hindu pantheon. At the end of the Naman, where everybody waits, and I also was waiting, is the entertainment part. The actors are fisherful, reindeer, podeer, sweepers of our Panjim roads. They don't have a formal education. Neither they have attended any school of drama. But their performance is purely inborn, enjoyable. I'm going to just share with you, when I went for that festival, we were invited to have dinner at one of the houses of the fisherfolks. And when I entered, I saw against the wall at the entrance a platform of wood. And over there, there were images of St. Anthony, of St. Francis Xavier, of Our Lady of Miracles of uh, Mafsa, and a, a Christ, and continued with the images of the Hindu gods. And I asked the, 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 the woman who is invited us, I said, how come you are Hindus? No, why, he says. We always respect what our grandfathers had respected, and we continue that till today. The last chapter of my book deals with Lada Inyar in Goa. I was very inquisitive about the origin of Lada Inyar, and I have informed the readers about its journey to our Catholic Church. Most of us have sung them either in Latin, in Konkani, or in English. And we know that they are sung either near the crosses which are scattered all over our landscape of Goa or within the four walls of homes. I will again stop here to tell you that every year, till 2019 or 20 when the COVID came, we used to sing Lada Inyash at home. And it was a very large affair. A large family that I have, they used to come, friends from uh, wherever they are, extended family, friends from abroad, everybody used to come. I used to choose a day in December because most of the people used to come in December. And everybody used to sing. And my sister-in-laws who are there, they are witness to that because they also participated. So they used to, they used to sing in Latin, then continue with saying the prayers in Konkani. And it was a great spiritual ritual. The villagers whom I met during my investigation and participation have become my new friends. Like before Zagor, Surya Kant will call me, Madam, I'm so Zagor, I tell you, this is not a Yo, I'm not a thing. I'm in Sangla, Jona Kiromala. And like that for other festivals. Such simple people, but rich in attraction. A interaction? Is it? Would anyone like to say something? How did you get the energy and the inspiration to study all this? Somebody is always there within us, Mr. Rosario, Dr. Rosario, always. If you only ask him to help you, he is always with you, walking with you. Thank you. Yes, yes, Sanjay. Which is one, which is one, uh, which is one festival that you have seen. I've seen all. Yeah, if you have liked Bosque and why? I like Zagor. I like, um, I didn't go for, to Konko because I get frightened of those colors they draw. That's why I didn't go there. 
but uh, almost every festival is enjoyable. I liked all festivals. I can't say I didn't like this, I didn't like that, all. We went for Toshan Chai Fest, great. We went to Tisra Chai Fest, it was great because we enjoyed the Sambare and Tisra Chai Sambare at the end. It was so great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Generous book. Uh, my name is Rupert I'm from Australia, but uh, a daughter of Sakura and Salinga. And uh, I just wanted to make a suggestion for your second book, whether you might be interested in writing about how the Goan diaspora uh, might be taking up these festivals and continuing them around the world. But um, this book can be really important. Uh, so I wanted to challenge Jason's comment and just say uh, I'm really grateful that it's an English and it'll be very useful to many of us who live far away from Goa but have Goa in our hearts. Thank you. Well, I think Celine was quite explicit in everything that she brought out. And uh, I did say a very colorful, a very invigorating book. And uh, if you have an insight into some of the festivals that she narrated, I'm sure you will enjoy it all the more if you read through the books at your own leisure. And Obviously, her objective is that you also will follow suit and visit the festivals because that gives the people of Goa the joy that people from the city are joining us. They are so thrilled, as you can see. They keep on inviting her for dinner and inviting her all the time. And so she has invitations for the rest of her years now. So she can share the invitation with us too. And that's the best way to learn the culture of the place, the feast and the fest. Yes, the color of the book will speak for itself. Dr. Paul Gong. Director of Fundação Orient, I thank you, sinceramente agradecido, Sr. Doutor, for sponsoring this event today and also a part of printing the book. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Jason, I know how busy, busy you are, yet you set apart your time to launch my book to analyze it and to tell people what is lacking in my book. No, 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 no. <laughs> My deep gratitude to you. I know you are going to proceed for final year of priestly formation. I pray that the Holy Spirit blesses you. I wish you bon voyage. Bon voyage to go and to come back to go. We need you. Let's see. Lucette, I have no words to say thank you to you, my dear friend, for the continuous support, not only for this book, but throughout the years of our friendship. Dr. Mimi and Mr. Cesar Menezes, I am profoundly grateful to you for sponsoring a part of printing this book. Thank you and God bless you. Mr. Hash Vardhan Bhatkuli, I don't think he's here because he told me he has some other function, the designer of the book and also the printer. 
Thank you, Hash, for making the book so attractive, especially the placement of the photographs. Incidentally, Hash was my student at Peoples, and I'm very proud of him and proud of so many other students who are here. They stayed in Goa, they did not migrate, and they're doing well here. Thank you, friends and family, and all the distinguished persons who have made this event a great success. Thank you one and all.